Yep. And it should be sharing now. Yep. I've got slides and it's all yours. Okay. Great. Hi, I'm Shino. I'm a Yuri visual novel developer. Um, I'm often a director, scenario writer, and character artist for my games. And last year, I spoke at VNConf on the top of Game Jams. This year, I'll be speaking to you about polishing a release, the little feature that could. So what is polish? At least in the context of this talk, polish will refer to delivering your game with both style and usability. The previous UI and art direction talks kind of cover what style is in this definition, and usability will refer to having a well-tested game that takes into account UI considerations and accessibility. My talk will be mostly focusing on the UX and accessibility side of things, giving your players a better experience in terms of the usability of your game. As such, I'll be exploring the following with a focus on improving the UX of interactive features in the core VN experience, how you should add in some accessibility features, and how you might consider additional quality of life features in your game, depending on what type of genre and game you're making in general. So firstly, I'll start off with the core VN experience. In other words, reading, using, and interacting with the narrative of your game and the system. For the most part, you want your player to be able to read your narrative as conveniently as possible for them. So interactive components in the game application should mostly be there to enhance the player experience, whether it's part of your narrative or just there to give your players more control. So the first element I'll start with is the entry point for the majority of the available system actions in a typical visual novel, the quick menu. So the quick menu should generally be easy to click and inobtrusive if present on screen. It should be easy to understand. So text-based quick menus should use standard terminology and icon-based quick menus should use standard icons and or use tooltips. Additionally, you should make sure that your quick menu actually works or that your user thinks that it works by providing prompt feedback once you click on a button. Here's an example of a text-based quick menu. So you'll note that the terminology is pretty straightforward. It's standard, easy to understand. The color contrast and the size of text ones make them easy to press. If you have a tiny text one, well, that's going to be a pain in the ass and try to make it a little bigger. But also notice that icons are used in this menu as well. A downside of text-based quick menus is that they take up a lot more space. So many games will use a combination of icons and text. So if you're thinking now, well, if I don't have enough space, how about I just go with icon-based quick menus? So I do prefer icon-based quick menus. They're compact and cute to look at, but they come with the major caveat of making sure that your players actually know how to use them. Like, what do these icons even mean? It's often harmless to let your player waste a few minutes trying to figure out what the quick menu does, but if they do something like skip to the next scenario block, that's like a huge problem. You want to make sure that your player can avoid making mistakes that are detrimental to their playing experience and that the player won't have to waste their time figuring out the quick menu icons. Providing a tutorial screen like this is useful, but I would consider it to be kind of insufficient as the player still has to remember this information. And if you're thinking now, hey, that's not even a problem. My icons are totally obvious. You should ask yourself, aren't all of these icons obvious? Like half of them are using the same icon, but in like a different style. The variety of seemingly obvious icons out there means that you should both choose obvious icons. That'll make your player's life a lot easier, but you should still also clarify what these seemingly obvious icons do. My recommendation for clarifying these icons is to just have tooltips as they're relatively inobtrusive and don't require a player to go out of their way to search for clarification in the same way that only having a tutorial screen would. But regardless of how you want to make sure that players actually know how to use their quick menu, once you have the quick menu in place, you need to make sure that they also believe that the quick menu actually works. So you have to provide feedback to confirm that the button was successfully clicked. For most quick menu items, that's just pulling up a corresponding screen once the button is clicked. Having a cute transition is a plus. But for stuff like auto mode, well, there's no screen to particularly pull up. And unlike skip, uh, text is not going to be flashing by at light speed because you want your play to actually be able to read your game. But at the same time, you don't want your player to have to repeatedly press this button, unsure if they've toggled it on or off, only to toggle it the other way around and then spend like another 15 seconds like, why is my game not proceeding? So a common way that visual novels will confirm 
that auto and similar items are on is by highlighting the auto button. In other words, creating an active state for your item that is differentiable from the idle state. Of course, there are settings uh, where your active state might be a bit hard to tell from your idle state if your idle state is like light gray and your active state is like white. So in that case, you might need to do some extra feedback to tell the player that, hey, auto is on, you don't need to click it again or else it will not be auto anymore. One option of doing that is to hide the click to continue icon and or the quick menu as this makes auto mode pretty obvious and remove distraction from reading. But at the same time, many games choose not to hide either, and there are other ways to show that auto is on. In general, this is just to say that you should provide feedback for all the buttons on your quick menu, because if you don't, the player might assume that your quick menu does not work, which is something that you don't want them to assume. But speaking of click to continue icon, I'd also like to make a very short aside on recommending the click to continue icon to be an option in your game. So it's the animated indicator that your line has finished, and the user should click to continue the progress in the narrative. Like I mentioned, it's a potential secondary feedback mechanism for stuff like auto, but can also be useful for narrative purposes, such as if you have weights and pauses in your lines, since you don't want the player to just click through it thinking, oh, the line is done, right? If you're not super sure what I'm talking about by click to continue icon, here's an example. Typically, they're not very intrusive and they use small animation to cue the user into the fact that the line is complete. And they'll often be simple and clean shaped or something thematically relevant. Since they're pretty inobtrusive, they're also useful for small narrative uh, actions, such as uh, indicating what the POV character is, such as by changing the color in Heart of the Woods. But now let's move on to the screens that are in a typical visual novel that can be accessed via the quick menu. Firstly, I'll talk about history as it's the place where you read back on sections in the script that you might have missed. For the history, there are two main points that you should take into consideration when designing it. The first one is that you should provide a long enough history to back read. So not all games will let you read all the way back in the script. But at the same time, if you only provide like 10 lines, the player might be like, oh, I'm trying to figure out the context of the scene because I missed it or something like that. And I literally cannot figure it out with just 10 lines. So you should think about how your story is written and then determine how many lines the history should provide. And additionally, depending on what feature you have in your game, your history screen might need to provide extra utilities. Such as if your game has voice acting, I would generally recommend having some sort of voice replay functionality in your history screen. And also I'd like to make a note that history is similar to rollback, but it does fulfill a slightly different use. So if you have both, that's a plus, and I would not recommend getting rid of either if it's already built into your engine, such as Rempy. If you need an example of a nice history screen, I recommend Letters from a Rainy Day, Oceans and Lace as a nice example, as it has voice replay, line jumping, and a bunch of cool mini functionality built in. And it also even allows you to scroll all the way back to the very first line of the game, even if you're hours in. So for the most part, your game probably doesn't need to have that level of history, but it certainly stands out in a positive manner. The next screen I like to talk about is the save load screen, since basically every single VM out there has this in there, just like every single VM more or less has some sort of history rollback. So the save load screen should provide context of when and where your player is in the story. And you should also make sure that you provide sufficient slots for all choices in your game without requiring the player to overwrite anything, as it's really common for visual novel players to save at every single choice, even if you, the developer, know that like, okay, choosing a different flavor of ice cream literally does nothing in the branching, the player does not know. So they're going to save there, and if you run out of save slots and make them overwrite stuff, they'll be like, dang, which one do I overwrite now? So just don't make them have to go through that struggle. In addition to like just generally being useful and not like making it hard for them, I recommend having stuff like indicators for the newest save, possibly having a file deletion button. And if you have deletion, uh, also having something like a files locking option, as it'll keep the players from making mistakes that will make them upset that they overwrote something. Note that even if you don't have formal chapter names in your VN, it's generally helpful to provide info on where the player is in the story with descriptions, in addition to having like the little screenshot preview and the time stamp as just because they can see the image and possibly like 
align in the script doesn't mean that they'll actually remember like when the character is like yelling ha or something like that. So just make it easy for them to continue reading your game from where they last left off. Before we move on to the next screen, I'd also like to make a short aside for RemPy. So if you're reskinning the RemPy UI, please note that RemPy allows you to go beyond nine pages of save slots, which is really great. But if you expect your game to have lots of pages of save, you might want to consider updating the pagination to allow easier navigation through high number of pages. The number of pages that you allow players to have of saves will probably determine how you uh, present your save and load screens. And finally, let's talk about uh, the config screen, which honestly, I would say that your players should not be spending too much time here in general, since you're trying to make them read a visual novel, not play like a configuration screen simulator. So in general, you should provide some reasonable default settings so they don't have to change every single setting. So for example, don't have your audio blasting at 100% on load, just like have it at like 50 or 70% or something like that. And try to avoid overwhelming users by making sure that you're categorizing options in a logical manner and providing reasonable levels of support. Since you don't need to give everything a slider, something can be radio buttons, something can be toggled. You don't need to give them like all the options in the world just make it a reasonable level of support. And additionally, to prevent them from having to click back and forth and back and forth from your config screen and the game itself, I would also recommend providing some sort of preview so they can know exactly what their settings changes are actually doing. Note in this example how the settings are split between two main categories with many subcategories. This is one way to organize your settings screen to make it easy for the players to use. If you have features in your game, then you probably want to have some sort of settings for it, such as if you have voice acting in a game, you'll probably want to allow users to toggle or modify the volume of the voice acting. That's just how it is, because players will want to be able to customize their experience to a certain extent. But if you have a lot of settings, also don't be afraid to split them across different pages. This is better than making a very cluttered and hard to navigate single page. Instead, just make it easy for the users to do what they want, get in quickly, and leave quickly too. Now that I've covered the very basic screens of the core VN experience, I'd also like to make a few small recommendations before moving on to the next section. So my first recommendation is to have system sound in your game, as this will provide feedback to interactable items, making it obvious that, hey, that thing is like a button, you can click it. And also it adds like personality. So this is like style points, but there are style points I really like. So most games will use some very like system sound sounding system sounds, but if you do have the budget and voice actor, having fun system sound can really set your game apart. So not sure how you would tell someone voicing a dog to, can you voice the dog barking for your system sound? Like when you click the buttons, but you know, definitely stands out in a positive manner. And my next one, Recommendation is to have splash screens in your game as like in general, they're very useful for providing pre-game notices such as content warning, you should definitely have them and studio information. And playing a bit fast and loose with the definition of splash screens. Uh, I also recommend having some sort of first time only screen before the game starts up that allows the player to initialize important settings like gameplay options, accessibility options, and language. There are some games that will also use first time tutorial splashes like the quick menu uh, tutorial that I showed earlier in the presentation. But just remember that these first time screens should only be shown on the first boot up. And you should probably make your splash screens like not super long uh, as you don't want to make the player like get annoyed when they're booting up your game. Like they don't need to reinitialize stuff every time, just do what they need and then move on. So next let's talk about accessibility in your game. Uh, in general, when you're making a VN, you should aim for an accessible product and also provide optionality. So accessibility options are often provided in the configs like this after the first time splash screen of the slide and stuff. So what should you think of when you're making your visual novel more accessible? Well, firstly, this is useless advice, but also like you should start with a good design. So this is not a UX talk, a UI talk, so I won't really be going deep into like what color contrast stuff, font choices, and like usable defaults that you should do, but just start with something that people can read. But when it comes to um, accessibility features, uh, in general, you should 
make sure that they're easily accessed and whichever ones that you're putting in, you should actually be supporting them. This is like a general statement, even though a lot of stuff will probably be already supported by Engine in some form, such as voice, self-voicing, which is my first recommendation for features that you should add into your game. With self-voicing, while it might already be supported by the engine or your computer or whatever, you should try to make sure to check the pronunciation of the self-voicing system as stuff like proper nouns, especially if you're using like fantasy names and stuttering and unusually pronounced terms uh, might get like totally garbled by the computer. So you might need to go in and add some custom alt text or something like that, unless you want your self-voicing users to just get some like weird pronunciation of your character names. My next recommendation for accessibility feature that you should probably add into your game is having image descriptions, so allowing users to toggle on extra text that will describe stuff in the story, like the location, characters, expression, poses, and stuff like that, that shows up visually on screen. Uh, the description text would be pretty much naturally added in, like writing a novel. So then like the people who are using these image descriptions won't be getting like a weird, like jarring experience of your visual novel story. And finally, uh, as I really don't have that much time to go through every single feature that you might want to add in, um, I'd like to also recommend having text options as an accessibility feature in your game. So this will often go under their own category, but in general, you want to allow users to customize the display of the text so then they can actually like read it comfortably. So settings that you might want to add are font settings, size, color, spacing, and whatnot. With font, you'll want to provide a dyslexia option, like open dyslexic. But I also recommend Atkinson hyperlegible since I actually find that easier to read. But that comes to a question of, OK, that's a lot of stuff. And some of them are just toggles on and off, but some of them are like provide a lot of choices. How many choices should an option have? So keep in mind that regardless of how many choices you're adding, you should make sure that the screen is not cluttered, like make the configs easy to use. But if you have too few choices, your players will be dissatisfied. If you have too many choices, your players will be like, wait, which one do I choose? I'm stuck, like choice paralysis. So uh, the number of choices uh, is really up to you. My personal preference is like around three, but regardless of how many choices you choose, you should be providing all the options you're providing like supported. So for example, if your text box overflows, because you provide an extra large font size option, that's like a bug. So you should probably fix that. And when it comes to uh, how you should prevent these choices, um, if you have like around two to three discrete options, radio buttons are pretty nice for toggling. If you have a few more discrete options, I recommend something like a drop down, but at the same time, like don't like put too many things in the drop down because people are gonna get stuck. And that's not good. You want them to be able to actually read your game. And if you have something that's more like a range of things, you might want to use sliders. So keep in mind the min and max of your slider, as that will more or less determine what you need to support uh, in your game. So I've only really talked about three accessibility features. And there's, uh, I think, other accessibility talks from previous years in VNConf. I'd also like to mention a few others that you might want to add into your game, such as having some sort of photosensitivity toggle, screen shake toggles, audio captions, graphic images filters, maybe for like phobias or whatever, if you happen to show like a lot of spiders in your game and so on. And finally, um, I'd also like to make a very short section on how you might want to determine adding in extra quality of life features into your game, depending on what type of visual novel you're making. So. In order to make your player experience better, in general, you need to know your game. Like, what is the genre? How long is it? Branching structure, do you have like unlocking routes or whatever? Do you have mini games? Do you even have like uh, choices in your game? So on. And I'll show how um, this game, top three Yuri games, in my opinion, um, kind of adds in some interesting features that match with what type of game it is to make the player experience better. So firstly, um, well, after looking at all the examples in this slide deck, you're probably like, well, it's definitely Yuri, right? Like Yuri Gay. Yeah, it is a Yuri game, but also the genre is occult fantasy Japanese mythology. So it's throwing a lot of terminology around, like Buddhist terms and whatnot. So 
even if you're a Japanese person, you probably don't know all these terms. So it adds in a glossary to help players be able to better understand the story. And when you have a glossary, you also need to make sure that the players can actually use the glossary. So this game has a alphabetization um, function and also identification of new entries into the glossary, which makes the uh, experience for the player of using this glossary a lot easier. So how about how long is this game? Well, it's pretty long. VNDV said it's like 34 hours. I think it's more like 60 hours to me, but you know, long. So this game adds in a function to have an alarm, which will vibrate, make a sound or both or none when skip finishes. So this is pretty useful if you have a really long game that has a trunk that's shared between the different routes and you need to skip through stuff. While you might want to consider adding a skip to next choice function if you have a lot of uh, shared trunk content, there are times when new scenes will be unlocked that will be skipped over if you do skip to next choice. So they add in an alarm when skip finishes function, which is probably the only time I've ever seen this, but you know, pretty useful. And how about the branching? So the branching in this game, there's, well, a lot of branching since it has 56 endings and there are also um, route locks on the character routes. As such, since uh, you probably don't want to like spend your time trying to figure out like every single ending where you get ganked by like a little red goblin, there's a there's a spoiler unlocking option that lets you unlock stuff in the game without having actually read it. So it's kind of like marking stuff as read so you can see the CDs and access endings without having to go through the trouble of possibly like finding out how to get certain endings. This is also useful if you're making a remaster or a sequel of a previous game that includes previous game content. Uh, you probably don't want your previous players to have to go through the entire game again if they wanted to get the like new game plus material. So those are just a few examples of how Alex Hero has interesting quality of life features that match with the type of game it is to make the player experience better. So you should just try to make sure that you know your game, what the genre is, like what the length is, the branching, blah, blah. Do you have gameplay and so on in order to make sure that the players have a better time playing your game. You're wanting to make life more convenient for your players. So then they'll look back on your story like, oh, that was such a nice story. Instead of being like, dang, I took forever to figure out how to do the configurations. And in order to do that, uh, you mostly just want to make sure you're following some basic rules of thumbs for UX and thinking from the player's point of view. So are you providing feedback and status on what's going on in your game? Are you preventing the player from doing like stupid errors, giving them control over their customization of their experience, making sure that they don't have to memorize random stuff and just being consistent in general? If you are, then that's a good sign. So hopefully this talk has kind of answered how do I create a improved experience for my players? And yeah, just make stuff more usable and accessible, uh, hopefully following some of the stuff I talked about. And depending on your game, um, you can think about adding in additional quality of features, but not all feature fits with every game. So yeah, make games. Thanks for listening. And I hope there's like a few minutes for questions. Yes, there's a couple. What are, we can probably do one or two questions. Chat, do your thing. Oh, okay, so how do you balance having lots of uh, quality of life accessibility features and not having options menus um, that are just way too full of stuff? Like, um, how do you balance those? Um, I guess it's like, if you know your game, it's a lot easier since there are some features that just, they're cool, but they're not really useful, like flowcharts are very useful in the Zero Escape series, but probably for like your typical like Harem Aerial Garden like that, like you're never really gonna use your flowchart, so just don't add it in if it doesn't actually add any use to your game. And otherwise, I would just say like, what do you like? Like, cause like a lot of this is kind of like my personal opinion because I get really annoyed when the, I have to keep on pressing auto and it's like, is it working or not? Like, you're also hopefully a VN player, so try to make experience that you think that your players will like. Um, how do you trick self-voicing into getting stutters right? Um, not gonna lie, I haven't actually gone through to do the alt text myself ever, because like all the accessibility stuff in my games, like a 
I worked with Papaya on. So she probably knows more about that. Cool. All right. Then thank you so much for talking. I'm sure that people will come up with more questions. And then the next person is Quilly.